Climate change has made Atlantic hurricanes more destructive to the environment and to vital infrastructure and more harmful to the physical and mental health of affected populations. Socioeconomically disadvantaged and racial and ethnic minority populations sustain disproportionate harm from such storms. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with James Schultz and Krista Nottage. Dr. Schultz is Director of the Center for Disaster and Extreme Event Preparedness at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He's co-authored a perspective article on the environmental injustice inflicted by climate change-driven hurricanes. Dr. Schultz, what evidence is there to suggest that Atlantic hurricanes have become stronger in recent years, and how established is the link between that storm strength and climate change? Thank you very much for that question. Certainly, climate is changing. There has been a worldwide research endeavor that has demonstrated climate change is a reality, and climate change is changing hurricanes. We have made it a point to do some of our papers, including this one, with climate scientists, in this case, Dr. Jim Cosson, who is a NOAA scientist. And so what we know is that after watching storms over periods of decades, that these storms are becoming stronger, wetter, and also slower moving as they move on land over coastal and island-based populations. So the evidence is that we are seeing more category three, four, and five major hurricanes. We are seeing with some frequency that these storms are reaching very high peak wind speeds. Dr. Cousin talks about how we are actually raising the speed limit on these hurricanes. This is the rotational speed. And we also see evidence of rapid intensification. One of the key examples just happened with Hurricane Dorian, which increased from 150 to 185 miles an hour in just nine hours. And it did so from such a high baseline of 150 miles an hour that we have just never seen this before. Weather in terms of the fact that Dorian pulled a 23-foot storm surge over the Bahamas Islands. And another example would be the well-known and renowned example that Hurricane Harvey dropped 33 trillion gallons of rain over Houston and Northeast Texas. And Dr. Cousin himself has been one of the people who has demonstrated how over actually a whole century, we're starting to see evidence that these storms tend to be slowing down over populated areas. And that's a concern because it means that there is a lengthier exposure of the populations beneath the storm to the hazards of wind and water. We saw this with Harvey over Houston, Florence over the Carolinas, and Dorian over the Bahamas. In fact, Dorian was over the Northwest Bahamas for about 48 hours before it moved northward. We're also seeing evidence that human actions, burning of fossil fuels and the greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide and methane, tend to be setting up what is actually making these changes, what we call climate drivers. So we have anomalously warm ocean and air temperatures. In fact, 2019 will join the five preceding years to become the six hottest years on record. And it is the warm ocean energy that is the source of energy for hurricanes. And we're also seeing that the warm waters of the ocean go down deep. So this tends to continue to propel hurricanes at high strength. And also warmer air temperatures are able to absorb more moisture. So the atmospheric moisture carrying capacity that generates very heavy rainfalls and precipitation rates, that is also increasing. And then we have sea level rise. And sea level rise is very simply due to the expansion of the ocean because warmer water takes up more volume, as well as the melting of the polar ice. Putting these things together gives us the trifecta of the stronger, wetter, slower moving storms. Dorian actually exemplified all three. You say in your perspective article that these escalating effects of hurricanes on population health represent a double environmental injustice. Why is it that marginalized people often experience disproportionate harm from hurricanes? Well, this has actually even predated our focus on climate change. More vulnerable, marginalized, disadvantaged populations do tend to sustain disproportionate harm in a variety of different types of disaster scenarios, certainly in hurricanes. Part of it has to do with the fact that these individuals are living in neighborhoods with inferior home construction, older housing stock, poor and fragile infrastructure, including power systems, possibly in areas of geographic vulnerability, for example, in floodplains. They may lack insurance. And because of the nature of their neighborhoods, they are more likely to be displaced, less likely to be able to return, and more likely to be evicted from damaged homes and property. You also write that island-based populations contribute negligibly to global carbon emissions and therefore to all of the climate issues that you've laid out as increasing hurricane risk. 
So the problem is not of their making. Has this been acknowledged, this inequity in the international community or any attempt to address it? Well, it's very interesting that you would mention that. So first of all, when we talked about double environmental injustice, we first of all mentioned the disproportionate harm to marginalized populations. The point I would also like to add to that is that while this has been around for a long time, now due to climate change, the hazards are more destructive, so there's a potential for greater harm. Then the point that you've just made is that, for example, the island states, the small island states, and there are 29 of those designated by the United Nations and the Caribbean, contribute negligibly to the greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the 44 million people who live in the Caribbean contribute less than one half of 1% to global carbon emissions, Bahamas just to a fraction of 1%, a very tiny fraction. And so what we're seeing here is this was actually addressed just last week. At the Conference of the Parties 25th meeting, the COP25 in Madrid, it was Bahamas and a variety of small states, including small island states, that were really calling up on the high emitting countries to be able to take a very strong role in being able to curb climate change. And so these issues have absolutely been raised and the folks who are living in the island states are well aware that they are contributing minimally to global warming, to climate change, but they are disproportionately impacted by these increasingly severe storms that are sometimes described as climate-driven hurricanes. Looking at Dorian and the Bahamas, what kinds of health effects are we seeing there several months after the hurricane? So here's the situation. The mortality at the time of impact is not great usually, and there were an estimated 60 deaths at Great Abaco Island and 10 more in Grand Bahamas. So the mortality figures are not very large. And we see this consistently because of the ability to warn, to be able to take shelter. In the case of island populations, evacuation generally is not an option. So that means that the people who do remain are exposed to the storm hazard. But what we are seeing are a series of injuries, including traumatic and amputating injury, blunt trauma from flying debris, injury from structural collapses at the time of the storm. And just this morning, I received a report because the University of Miami is working at Marsh Harbor Hospital, and that is on Great Abaco Island. And that's where the storm initially made landfall at a record setting 185 miles an hour. And this is where we've seen the extraordinary destruction in major photographs that have been published that show just a demolition of the shanty towns and the structures in the area. So what is being reported right now as the University of Miami is offering medical personnel for intermediate support is that almost all patients have sustained psychological trauma because they were there during this exposure. One of the key points about Hurricane Dorian is because it slowed down, plus it came in at extremely high wind speeds, and it pulled a very high storm surge over the islands, is that almost everyone who was there was exposed for a very protracted period of time. It took almost 48 hours for the storm to pass over the islands of Great Abaco and Grand Bahama. And the next thing that they are observing right now, about two to two and a half months out from the storm, is exacerbation of chronic illness. So out of control diabetes mellitus, out of control hypertension, and in general, this is due to the suspension of primary care treatment, the lack of medications, delays in seeking care, a lack of transportation, other barriers that are making it difficult to come to hospitals that themselves have been damaged and impacted. So for example, the other piece that is happening is right now, they are seeing on a day-to-day basis that during the recovery and the rebuilding phase, there are injuries related to that, lacerations and puncture wounds and fractures, but because, for example, this particular hospital in Marsh Harbor does not even now have an operating x-ray machine, there are times where they actually have to fly patients with fractures or other medical problems that require x-ray. They have to fly them from Great Abaco to NASA to get x-rayed. So these are some of the things that are being seen as of this morning. Is there anything that small island and coastal communities can do on a local level to be better prepared for these stronger storms? I think that there are major things that can be done. And one of the things that University of Miami hopes to be involved in with uh, Bahamas specifically is in the rebuilding of the healthcare infrastructure. So we had actually suggested several possibilities that are not just focused on Bahamas, but actually could be applied in all areas that might be affected by some of these climate-driven storms. So we need to be thinking in terms of improving building codes, redesigning neighborhoods, redressing existing socioeconomic inequities, 
so that the housing stock, the healthcare facilities, and so forth are retrofitted and able to withstand these anticipated stronger hurricanes, and that they maintain their life-saving services and operability for life-sustaining treatments. So one of the major issues that comes up is that, for example, you may not be able to get insulin to people with type 1 diabetes or continue renal dialysis or have radiation oncology treatments for cancer patients. So health systems all across the eastern coasts of North America and Central America that are in the potential impact zone for Atlantic hurricanes, as well as the multiple dozens of island states, need to be thinking about how do we build back better and retrofit the communities. We also need to enhance the warning systems and the shelters. And one of the major issues, and this affects also the mental health issues, is that in these island nations, evacuation is rarely an option. And that means that there is going to be widespread population exposure to the hurricane hazards themselves. As you probably know, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a disorder of event exposure. Here in Florida, many of us have the option to evacuate. Even if it's a long and harrowing evacuation, we can get out of town. That's not the case for island-based populations. So we need to be thinking in terms of how to build more secure hurricane shelters. So as what happened in portions of Great Abaco, where people were in shantytown environments that were completely destroyed, and then the storm had slowed down and was hovering for more than a day directly above the population, These particular areas need to be rebuilt in a way that will be sustainable. The other issue is to get citizen engagement in disaster preparedness. In our paper, we mentioned that there have been examples of where there is widespread citizen engagement, but typically in nations where they have a very different uh, political structure like Cuba. But we really need in the U.S., in the islands, in Central America, to be able to have better citizen engagement and disaster preparedness. And the other thing that we have mentioned is to increase collaborations among climate scientists and population health scientists and clinicians. And actually, in our paper, we have that. We have population health scientists. We have the Minister of Health of the Bahamas. We also have a renowned atmospheric scientist as well. So that's just a microcosm, some of what we have been suggesting going forward. So altogether, that's the tall order. Is there commitment on the part of the international community, or is there funding available for that kind of transformation? I wish I could say that that was the case. I think the outcome of some of the recent meetings in Madrid have indicated that there are variable levels of political will to be able to address climate change generally. But the reality is, and we actually mentioned that sea levels will not recede and average global temperatures will not decline and hurricane hazards will not moderate, at least in the foreseeable future. So we really do have to be looking for opportunities to prepare the communities most likely to be impacted by these hurricanes. And the University of Miami is doing that in part with the Bahamas, but just in certain portions where we are working closely. So it will probably be dependent upon many different entities to help to better prepare populations for future hurricanes. Finally, what role can physicians play in advocating for policies that can reduce the effects of climate change, including these extreme weather events? It's interesting that we're actually right now engaged in working on a series of publications that focus on special medical needs patients. So in terms of what we have proposed, whether we're working with persons who are dealing with the mental health aspects and we're speaking to psychiatrists or psychologists, or whether we happen to be writing to a population of clinicians who deal with patients who have cancer or patients who have, for example, spinal cord injury or TBI, some of the other disorders. What we're suggesting is, first of all, start at home, personal and family preparedness, because clinicians will often be on the front lines, then preparing clinic and staff and workforce so that your healthcare centers and clinics are prepared and so are the personnel. In fact, one of the greatest areas for, I think, leveraging and interesting clinicians in preparedness is because they have such a passion for their patients. So it's important to be thinking about the specific needs of a spinal cord injury patient or a patient with type 1 diabetes or a patient who has need for assistive devices or a patient who has need for electronic technologies, such as those on long-term oxygen therapy and to be thinking about how do you specifically, if you live in the hurricane zone, or if you happen to live in areas where other disasters are prominent, such as wildfires in California or floods in the Midwest or tornadoes or what have you, how do you get your patient population, your clinics and your staff prepared to as much as possible before disaster strikes, be ready to 
a shelter, to evacuate, to have supplies stocked, and as much as possible to diminish the impact both during and after the storm. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. And now let's turn to Dr. Nottage, a Bahamian surgeon and NEJM editorial fellow who recently visited the islands affected by Hurricane Dorian. Dr. Nottage, what was it like to return home after Dorian, and what did you see? Well, watching the storm hover over the Bahamas for two days from Boston and hearing the frantic reports and emerging firsthand accounts was quite harrowing for me. I understood on the one hand that there was little I could do or anyone else, whether they were in the storm or on the nearby island of New Providence, where I live, or miles away in Boston as I had been. But I still felt disconnected and a little bit guilty for not being there. So it was good to return home about 10 weeks after the storm. And things had settled a bit and the recovery process had definitely begun. I traveled both to Grand Bahama and Great Abaco Islands, which were the two main islands hit by the storm. East Grand Bahama was like a ghost town. You couldn't tell whether the homes there were under construction, deconstruction, or whether it was a destruction zone. That's how it looked. There were watermarks on the buildings two stories high. The water table itself was salty when you went to go and brush your teeth, for instance. The main hospital there had suffered quite a bit of damage in the storm, both water and wind damage, and patients had to be moved out of that structure during the storm to nearby houses or other clinics. And so in the post-storm period, they had constructed a tent hospital with the assistance of a foreign aid group called Samaritan's Purse, which was wonderful. I went and visited the hospital. The structure of our original hospital is the hospital that serves the northern Bahamas, including Great Abaco Island and Grand Bahama Island. So to have that knocked out of use put a great strain and stress on the healthcare system. So the stories coming out of Grand Bahama were quite moving, which I'll tell you a little bit about, but I also visited Great Abaco Island, and the first thing you notice when you're flying over Abaco is that the aerial views, you're looking down on something that looks like almost like a war zone. There's just rubble. The ground is brown as though it's been burnt. The trees are, those trees that haven't been broken or bent are standing up kind of like a toothpick forest. There's no foliage. It's all been torn off. And so we landed. The airport had collapsed. Um, People are just kind of standing on the tarmac, those who'd returned home to do some repairs, for instance. And in Marsh Harbor and its surrounding settlements, the storm took cement buildings, cement blocks, and crumbled it like, like a sugar cube. You were just looking literally at the sand and the cement pebbles that remained from where a building stood. It was quite breathtaking. The storm flattened the wooden houses. Some houses, the only thing that remained was the foundation. It looked as though, as one resident told me, a sword had come along and just chopped the house from its base. I can't imagine the type of force, the wind force and the water force that could do that to a building. The amazing story is that many people survived. They survived outside in the storm. They survived the winds and the water and the pressure. So that's one of the great stories coming out of Dorian. But what you would see are huge containers and boats, fishing boats, sports boats, washed inland and literally resting against or on top of homes. So the damage from the wind and the power of the water was was very great. It was really something to see. You spoke to people on those islands, on Great Abaco and Grand Bahama, people who'd been there during the storm, what kinds of experiences did they describe to you? Well, even 10 weeks out from the storm, the persons who had experienced it were only now coming to terms and able to speak about what they had experienced, about how they had fared in the storm. So one thing that came across very strongly was the sound and the fury of the storm. Many persons told me it sounded like a freight train, but a freight train's crescendo whistle passing for two days, which is just an enormous sound, as you can imagine, and it shakes the foundations of any building that you're in. The other thing that people talked about was 
the huge storm surge. The water came up from the ground, through your bathtub, through your sink. It came over the land, and it went 15, 20 feet high. So if you had a second story to go to, that's where you went. But sometimes the first story was washed away. So there were many, many stories like that. A few stories stood out to me. There was an older gentleman who I spoke to who talked about noticing ants crawling into a boat that he keeps on a trailer in his front yard. For a week beforehand, these ants just kept covering his boat, and he'd wash them off and they'd return. And then the storm came, and he understood, and he said to me, I missed the sign. The ants were giving me a sign. And he had actually evacuated his home into the boat and stayed in that boat for two days in the midst of the storm because his own house had been flooded. He tied the boat to one of the pillars on the corner of his house. Then there was the story of the Grand Bahama Children's Home. The Grand Bahama Children's Home is a home for children who have no other home or family. They do take care of about 35, 32 to 35 children of different ages. And when the storm came, the waters started to come into the building, into their rooms, into their dorms, and the children became very frightened. The attendants or the administrators of the home had to think of a quick way to get all of these children to safety. They were evacuated, but something that stood out in their mind was that the children were just asking, is today the day I'm going to die? Am I going to die today? They were very frightened. They were very aware of an impending doom, which can only crumple your heart when it comes from a child who's so helpless and who's looking to you to help them for everything. So there were many persons displaced by this storm. Their houses were torn apart in Great Abaco Island. People had to run for cover to the government complex, which is a large building and the government clinic, and thousands of people took shelter in there, which made it a very cramped environment, a very stifling environment, but they had to go because there was nowhere else. Yes, there was warning that the storm was coming, but when you live on an island, there aren't many options for evacuation. So people had to kind of stay and just make do. There were shelters designated to go to. We always have a shelter, but the shelters were torn apart. So people were kind of hopscotching from one place to the next, trying to find a safe place to weather the storm. There were persons who had to swim from one place to the next because of the waters. And of course, these waters become a mixing pot for debris. And there are many stories about persons losing grip of their loved ones, and they're not sure what happened in the end, whether the storm washed them out to sea, whether they made it anywhere. There are still persons who are unaccounted for, but the storm was just so overwhelming. So there's a lot of repair that we have to do to ourselves and to our country because of the impact of this storm. So finally, beyond that repair, what can we take away from the storm? What can we learn? What's going to be important going forward? The theme of the Medical Association for this year in the Bahamas is rebuild, restore, and renew. And I think that has to be our focus. Aside from all of the different kinds of trauma that persons would have gone through, physical, emotional displacement, etc., loss, feeling very vulnerable, um, post-traumatic stress-related disorders, for instance, besides all of those things, we have to remember that even though in the Caribbean we pride ourselves on being hardy storm survivors, we've been through many, many storm seasons, these aren't the same hurricanes that your grandmother or your great-grandmother told you about. These storms are far worse, and they're getting stronger every year. It was Dorian this year, but we remember Maria and Irma from the 2017 hurricane season. Those two strong storms came two weeks apart and caused devastation to the islands of Virgin Islands, Dominica, St. Martin, Puerto Rico, Florida, Barbuda. So these storms are larger, they're more destructive, they're occurring more frequently, and they're far stronger than past generations. What we have to learn is that we can't ignore this pattern. We have to look for a way to break it. Climate change is at the center of all of our discussions now because of the mammoth scale environmental and weather disasters that we've seen, but there are also smaller scale health effects. I went to a lecture recently 
up in Boston about the health effects of climate change. And these are very real entities that we have to come to grips with and try to prevent at a primary stage before we're being reactive. We have to be proactive. So we have to look for ways to make changes now, even small ones, and remember that what you do doesn't just affect the sky or the environment around where you live, but there are knock-on effects further away beyond what you can see. Thank you, Dr. Nottage.